Imagine this white wall is Niagara Falls, and this video will be a lot more interesting. Hello and welcome to a more white and blank version of the Carnard, where I'm going to talk to you in this place because it's secure from the coronavirus. I hope you're all keeping well and staying safe because it's very important right now. And like me, I've come to this bunker with windows to make sure that I can stay safe during this. However, the real reason is I'm too lazy to set up outside and I'm working in my office and it's easier to just make the video here. Imagine this white wall is Niagara Falls and this video will be a lot more interesting. Today we're going to talk about the Renault Dauphine, which was produced from 1956 to 1966 under some very precarious uh, situation um, things. Basically it was built in secret and tested in the dead of night so that the French government wouldn't find out. And we're going to jump back into that in a moment, but don't forget to like and subscribe first because I need you to like and subscribe for me to continue making these or otherwise I'm going to be very sad. So the history of Renault in general was quite interesting. Um, Louis Renault, the, the founder, had founded the company in the early 1900s. Um, and he had made one of the first production motor cars um, in France and become quite popular. And during World War I, they started making trucks and, and airplane engines and things like that. And then they rebounded afterwards. And in the run up to World War II, they came out with the 2CV and became incredibly popular. They were one of the biggest brands in, if not the biggest brand in France. But then during World War II, obviously the Germans occupied uh, France. And unfortunately they wanted to force Renault to make trucks. And because he didn't want his whole company and factory and everything to be destroyed, he complied and allowed the, or started producing trucks for Germany. However, in an effort to slow this down, he would cause production delays, strikes, things like that, to make it look like there was accidental breakdowns and problems in their production line and slow down the Germans. Of course, the Allies weren't interested in hearing about this and they ended up bombing the factory. And they completely destroyed the factory along with killing 600 civilians. So, Allies not so bad that Hitler got... No, let's not get into that. So essentially, after, as the war came to an end, in 1944, uh, Louis Renault was uh, arrested and unfortunately uh, imprisoned where he died of some suspicious circumstances. So the, the Renault history is quite interesting when it comes to a lot of these weird things that happened during these war times. But Louis Renault unfortunately passed away in prison um, after being arrested in 1944. Now a guy called Pierre Lafouchot took over the reins of Renault after the war. And he wanted to continue on automobiles because this was the legacy of Louis Renault. And he knew that Louis Renault had tried to, you know, uh, help in a way and keep his people safe and keep the factory running. Um, and he wanted to keep that going. Unfortunately, the French uh, Ministry for Industry and Production wanted Renault to continue building the trucks that they were building during World War II because they thought this was a better way to help rebuild the country. But Pierre was against this and he knew that during the war, and in 1943 and 44, the engineers at Renault under Louis Renault had started building a prototype of what would become the 4CV. And slightly after the war, they brought in Porsche, Ferdinand Porsche of all people, to help to finish the design of this car. And it was released in 1947. And the French government, needless to say, were a little bit annoyed about this for various reasons. One, they wanted the production of trucks to continue their way. Two, they were a little bit annoyed at Louis Renault. And three, it didn't really help the fact that they got in the famous designer behind the Volkswagen Beetle um, to help them finish off what would become one of the most famous French cars. So the French government were quite annoyed about this whole thing and Pierre did it out of a, a, a thing for Louis Renault because he didn't really care about cars himself. He just knew that this was the DNA of the company. In fact, Pierre would come to work most days on a bicycle. So when it was time to start looking at what would come after the 4CV, 
he knew that they needed to start building something like this. And, and pressure was still going from the government, but he was aware that soon enough, because of rising standard of living in France and people were coming a little bit better off and the wartime had massively ended, he knew that people would be starting to look for a, an upscale car. And as such, he wanted to be the one to build this car. So basically, uh, Lafouchot went to one of the lead engineers on the 4CV project who was working on it in secret during the war, Fernand Picard. And he told him what he wanted to do and Fernand Picard and him had a full conversation and they decided to put this project into the works. So the problem with this was basically that the French government again did not want this to happen. So Fernand Picard put together a team inside the Renault factory and they started what was called Project 109 in 1949 that would go on for the next five years. And they started developing Project 109 which would become the Renault Dauphine in time in secrecy. And they were building on this and building on this and basically in the middle of the night they would go out and test it in various places. And they bought a couple of Volkswagen Beetles to test the quality against and they kept doing this over the years to make sure that they were keeping up with German engineering qualities. So Fernand Picard had this team together and they continued working on what would be known as Project 109 internally. And him and Lafouchot would meet in the middle of the night to stop anyone from knowing what was going on especially the French government, who were again pushing for the truck. So Fachot gave, La Fachot gave Picard some strict instructions other than just the secrecy. He also told him that this car needed to be able to reach a top speed of 68 miles an hour. It needed to do less than 40 miles, or more than 40 miles to the gallon, achieving more than seven kilometers per, or seven liters per 100 kilometers. And also he wanted it to have some strong color choices. The reason for this is there was a study that women cared more about the color of the car than they did about what the actual car was, and this would help with sales. So those were the strict instructions that began out on Project 109. So during this five years of testing in the middle of the night, Lafourchot would meet up with Picard and they would keep on working on things. And originally this Project 109 had a rear engine design and it did when it was finished, but the rear engine design included a 4CV engine. And CV stands for Cheval de Val, which is uh, horsepower, but it didn't have four horsepower. I still can't quite get my head around that. It had 19 horsepower. It was a 748cc engine. And Picard brought to Lafourchot's attention that this wasn't quite powerful enough for what they wanted to achieve. So they swapped this out with a new engine they had been working on, the 848cc engine, which became known as the 5CV engine. And this allowed them to get 32 horsepower and cruise along at 70 miles an hour, no problem. It would also be highly efficient compared to the old one and allowed for some of the things that they wanted to include in the engine or in the car design, should I say, to be, uh, to be looked after. So then the project became known as the 5CV and it would stick with that name until the year of release. Lafouchot would keep track of this project every night coming in and talking to Picard and helping them with the testing which they were doing on test tracks um, alongside a Volkswagen Beetle to make sure it was more efficient. Unfortunately uh, and ironically in some ways because he was not an automobile guy and he was more of a cyclist, Lafouchot never got to see this car come to fruition. On the 11th of February in 1955, he was killed in an unfortunate car accident while driving his Renault Fregat on some icy roads and never got to see the end of this project. But Picard continued on because he knew how important this project was. And in the meantime, another guy called Pierre Dreyfus had taken over the company and it was time for Picard to show Dreyfus this car. But before that, they shipped a few of the prototypes to different locations and drove them around in towns and kept again in secrecy, just testing these against Beetles and, and other cars that they wanted it to be more effective than. In 1955, November of 1955 to be exact, they unveiled this car to the press because Dreyfus, who had taken over, gave this car his blessing and was willing to fight the French government on launching it. So when they released this car to the press, it was released as the Renault 5CV. Now, interestingly, it was going to be called the Renault Corvette, but the Chevrolet Corporation, as you're probably aware, has a Corvette, and they only released this in the year of 1955 and had registered the name, so unfortunately, they couldn't go with that name anymore, and it was called the 5CV. However, in one of the press dinners around this, they were talking to one of the press team and some engineers and different people, and one of the guys who was covering closely the 4CV 
noted that he was calling, and he had heard a lot of people call the 4CV the Queen of the Road. And that's when he said, uh, that's when the name came about, the Delphine. Delphine is the feminine version of the word dolphin, which means heir to the apparent throne, and therefore made it fitting to take over from the 4CV, which was known as the Queen of the Road. In case you're not aware, the Delphine went on to be incredibly successful. The uh, 4CV had sold 500,000 units. This went on to send 2 million between 1956 and 1966, although it did cross over with the 4CV, which continued selling for a couple of years afterwards. This car, of course, being a French car, and if you've owned a French car, you're probably aware that electrical faults are quite a big issue, and the Delphine was, was no exception. The Delphine had a few issues. For example, um, it was one of the cars which when you turn the wipers on and had the lights running and the heating running, if you were driving at night in the rain, it would drain very quickly and the battery couldn't quite keep up. Luckily, they had thought about this and the rear engine mounted, uh, or the rear mounted engine was able to be crank started, which is hilarious, especially for a time when that was going away. The other thing was the original drum brakes that were in the car had a tendency to fade, which not a great thing if you're going down the hill quite quickly. So these were replaced in 1961 with uh, front disc brakes, which were a lot more effective and less prone to fade. Another issue with this car was the three, uh, three speed manual, which was in the original cars, only had a synchro mesh on the second and third gear, which meant that basically you couldn't go back into first while driving without messing around with the clutch quite a bit, which made this car a little bit difficult to drive, especially at the time people were used to this sort of thing, but I guess if you were to buy one now, you'd probably find it a bit of a pain to drive. So in 1961, they put a synchro mesh on the first gear as well and closed that off, and shortly thereafter introduced the four speed, which was a lot better. But it would take its time to get to 70 because this car had not to 60, of 32 seconds which as you're probably aware by modern standards is very 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 slow so this car was a massive su success and it was produced not only in france but it was sold all around the world being produced in different places it was produced in new zealand australia argentina along with japan and also in italy the interesting thing is that in Japan and Italy, it was also sold, but under different names. So in Japan, it was the Hino 900, which isn't that interesting. But the interesting one is that in Italy, this was built by Alfa Romeo under license as the Alfa Romeo Dolphin, or the Dolphin Alfa Romeo. And later, the Alfa Romeo Ondine, which was the high-end version of this car. So here you have it, a car that was built in secrecy. Uh, to live up to the legend who a man, of a man who was suspiciously dead in a prison after trying to keep his company going during World War II that went on to sell 2 million units and mapped out Renault as the massive company it is today taking over from the 4CV. And I think that is a beautiful story and, and something really, really good. So thank you so much for watching. Sorry again about the white background. I just got a lot of work to do today and I figure instead of inter in, uh, you know, getting in the way of that and going outside into the beautiful sunshine here in Mexico, I decided just to make it in my office. And I'm also recording tomorrow's one about the Austin Martin Lagonda. Um, so that's gonna be here as well. So we'll see you tomorrow to talk about the Austin Martin Lagonda. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And thank you so much for watching.